Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Thanks for joining us. First on the docket today, a little more of a reflection on Chris Watts. Next, an alleged co-conspirator charged in the death of Tupac Shakur says Sean Combs, a.k.a. P. Diddy, was in on it. A mistrial was declared in a case for witness misconduct. The threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. That is what is happening to two men accused of killing a 12-year-old girl in Houston, a minister who is not a man of God. And hey, am I the only one just finding out that finders, keepers, losers, weepers is not a defense to fraud? Really? And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Yes, I said criminals. As we posted the other day, you can't fix stupid, but you can give it a court date. These idiots got a court date. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. And make sure you hit that little bell for notifications so that you receive an update of when we go live or put up new content. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps as well. All right, first, today's show is sponsored by US Gold Trust. All right, we know that there is a lot of inflation going on. Uh, in the last several years, it is up nearly 20%. That leaves a lot of uncertainty as to the value of the dollar. And if you're like me and you've been putting money away for retirement, have you thought how far it's actually going to go? Well, that's where U.S. Gold Trust comes in and they can help reduce some of the uncertainty. Gold value is projected to hit an all-time high in 2024 with gold holding its value, unlike the dollar. It is a great investment. Now, there is a team standing by to answer any questions and walk you through the easy process of rolling over your 401k into precious metals if that is determined to be the right decision that you make. So check out the link below, fill out the information. Someone will be in contact with you and talk about it with them. If it's the right decision for you, do what you think is best. If it's not for you, hey, there's no harm in checking it out. I can tell you, I have gold. Um, it is a great hedge against inflation. And, you know, when the world, um, you know, becomes unplugged, it's not like you're going to be able to run to the bank or down to your local ATM machine to get your cash out. Need to have a little bit hanging around, and it's good to have a little bit of gold as well. All right, let's go ahead and get to the docket for July 25th, 2024. And uh, first on the docket, we brought you the story yesterday about Chris Watts. And um, we covered this case. This is frankly one of the cases that we started this program about. And if you go back and look at our earlier videos, we covered everything about it, including the interviews of Nicole Kessinger. Um, you know, uh, let's just say, there's no evidence that uh, she was involved. The police never prosecuted her. But uh, Chris Watts basically says that she was somehow involved. Now, I don't know if she gave an ultimatum, go to uh, divorce your, your, your wife, come be with me by a certain date. Who knows what happens? But we know that Chris Watts ultimately pled guilty to killing his wife, uh, Shanann, their unborn child, and then their two young little daughters. And then we find out in these letters that have been leaked by or produced by uh, Chris Watts's uh, friend that were corresponding while in jail, basically saying that uh, Nicole Kessinger was the Jezebel and he places the blame on her as it relates to what he did. You know, he put in that letter yesterday, her flattering speech were like drops of honey that pierced my heart and soul. Little did I know all her guests were in the chambers of death. Is this man completely removed from reality? He killed his wife, unborn child, and two daughters. Killed his wife, put her in a shallow grave near an oil tank battery, stuffed his two young daughters after he killed them at the worksite and stuff them into the tank, stuff them into the tank, literally pushing their little bodies in that tank to be 
laid to rest in crude oil. One of the most horrific things you could possibly think about. Anyway, in that letter yesterday, Chris Watts goes on and praises his wife, like I said, whom he killed, suggesting he had a really good life, but was tempted by the perfume of a strange woman. Almost as though he's acting as like he was completely uninvolved. I think these letters show that he is scarier and more horrific of a person than we thought he could be for all of those deaths that he was personally responsible for. Now, whether you think there was something else that persuaded him, there's no credible evidence that she, Miss Kessinger, was there. There's no credible evidence to say she said, go do it. There's no credible evidence that suggests that she was involved in it in any way. And we are certainly not saying she is, and everybody's given the presumption of innocence. But I really think that if the police had information, they thought that she was involved, they would have prosecuted her just alongside with Chris Watts. There was nothing there that amounted to credible evidence to go forward. Reality of it is, the guy was cheating on his wife, lying to his wife, lying to the mistress. I doubt there's ever going to be enough evidence stating that she was involved. And who are you going to believe? Chris Watts? I don't know. I wouldn't take my word from Chris Watts at all. Anyway, I think it just shows what a narcissist uh, this individual is, how completely removed from reality is to think that somebody else is responsible for what he did and what he got multiple life sentences for. All right. Next on the docket, you know who's having a bad year? Sean Combs. That's right. So the suspect in the Tupac Shakur murder has reportedly accused P. Diddy, a.k.a. Sean Combs, of paying $1 million to have the then 25-year-old rap star legend gunned down on the streets of Las Vegas nearly 30 years ago. Now, the prosecutors uh, going after the notorious California gangster Dwayne Davis, a.k.a. Kef D, named the disgraced music mogul 77 times using his various pseudonyms of Puffy, Puff, Daddy, Puff, and his legal name, Sean Combs, in some recent court filings. Now, the uh, pleadings were submitted in response to the defendant's request for bail, and they highlighted statements made by Davis, who's now 61, implicating old P. Diddy in Tupac's murder during uh, police and media interviews. Now, the first mention of his name is in the 179-page filing was in reference to the deadly rivalry that existed between the producer's East Coast company, Bad Boy Records, and Death Row Records, founded by Marion Suge Knight on the West Coast. There's another upstanding individual. Anyway, the prosecution stated that after the shooting, Kef D asserted that the conspiracy to commit the murder began in California between the defendant, Eric Zip Marlin, and Sean Combs. Now, the suspect purportedly went undercover alongside members of the Los Angeles uh, Police Department Task Force for a trip to New York seeking evidence that pointed to Combs and Martin in Shakur's death. Prosecutors wrote in their pleadings that Davis asserted publicly that he had only told on himself and wasn't trying to provide evidence against anyone else in the conversations with police. However, this statement belies his claims, they suggest saying that Sean Combs paid Eric Von Martin a million dollars for the killing. The prosecutors also summarized statements that the suspect made in an interview that aired on YouTube, writing, when Sean Combs reaches out to defendant, wondering if Southside Crips were responsible for Shakir's death by asking, is that us? The defendant, beaming with pride, answers yes. Now, these revelations detailed in the uh, pleadings mark the latest in the uh, drama plaguing the producer who became the subject, obviously, of federal sex trafficking investigation this year and faces a slew of lawsuits accusing him of uh, some abusive behavior towards women. He's having a bad year, ladies and gentlemen. Now, P. Diddy, I've told you, Sean, give me a call, man. I, everybody's entitled to counsel, but... Um, you need to get on it. You need to get on it. You need to get on it big. Obviously, these rumors have been floating around, but the question is, is Kef D really going to roll on you to save himself? I'm thinking he is. 
Old Sean Combs has not publicly commented on the accusations uh, brought forth by CAF D and now highlighted in the uh, pleadings in the court. Now, Mr. Davis, CAF D, is uh, being held in the Clark County Jail there in Nevada, awaiting trial on charges of murder with a deadly weapon with the intent to promote further or assist criminal gang activity. Now, he was arrested last September, and prosecutors say he is the only person still alive who was in the car used in the deadly drive-by shooting on the night of September 7, 1996. The indictment against Kef D said he carried out the willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing in association with notorious California gang, the South Side Compton Crips, and he allegedly obtained the murder weapon for the purpose of seeking retribution against Tupac Shakur or Marion Knight, a.k.a. Suge. Also in the vehicle were Terrence Brown, a.k.a. Bubble Up, DeAndre Smith, a.k.a. Big Dre, and Kef D's nephew, Orlando Anderson, a.k.a. Baby Lane. Prosecutors say that Davis handed the gun to either Big Dre or Baby Lane with the intent that this crime to be committed. Now, in a secretly recorded 2009 interview, Kef D could be heard telling police that his nephew was the one who pulled the trigger, killing the rapper with four 40 caliber rounds. Now, Kef D's trial is scheduled to begin on November 4th. We'll see if he rolls, like we're going to talk about in a minute. The threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. Now, how, you may ask, why did this all come out? Well, Kef D wants to have his bond posted. It was posted, and then the court became concerned about the source of the funds. They want to know who's posting the $125,000 cash bond. It used to be quite common in drug cases. People wanted to know if the source of money came from legitimate means. Now, obviously, Kef D's been locked up, reportedly said he was broke, was going to hire private counsel, didn't because Mr. Green did not show up. And so now he has the public defender. Being represented by the public defender, but you can post a $125,000 cash bond. I think inquiring minds want to know who is paying for that bond. Next, a mistrial because of a witness's misconduct. Now, normally, I must say, every time I've had a mistrial during trial, it's either been a family member who just wanted to get a little jab in or the police officer who just wanted to get a little jab in as well. They say something that's completely outrageous, inadmissible, and you get the mistrial. Well, that's pretty much what happened here. Anyway, from the start of this trial, the uh, judge, a guy by the name of Chris Miller, told the jurors hearing the case against Raymond Childs II that the path to justice would be very emotional, which is a little odd in and of itself. Judge is supposed to tell the jury you're not supposed to make your decisions on emotion. You're supposed to make your decisions based upon the evidence and the law. There is no place for emotion in a courtroom, ladies and gentlemen. Separates us from everybody else, supposedly, in the world. You take the emotion from the proceedings, apply the facts to the law. Anyway, now this Mr. Childs guy, he's got some bad accusations. He's accused of killing four of his family members, plus a pregnant woman, and her unborn child at the home that they all shared back in uh, January of uh, 2021. Now, Child's sister told jurors the uh, teenager feared a beating from his father for taking the family car without permission the night before. Now, during two days of testimony, there were some uh, lots of tears and crying shed in the courtroom as family members heard how Raymond and Kezi Child, their 13-year-old daughter Rita, 18-year-old son Elijah and his 19-year-old girlfriend Kiara Hawkins and their near-term son were killed as Raymond the third, 17 years old at the time, methodically went room to room in the split-level house, according to prosecutors, and shot to death everyone who was home, chasing his 15-year-old brother Xavier into a freezing darkness, wounding him twice, even as the surviving sibling offered the attacker the $44 cash he carried in his pocket with a promise not to tell, ultimately leaving that bloodstained currency lying in the snow. Well, the feelings became even more raw yesterday as the forensic pathologist described the fatal wounds of the victim accompanied by 
autopsy photographs. The motion boiled over from a witness stand in the afternoon as a key prosecution witness verbally confronted Childs in front of the jury, leading the judge to obviously get everyone out of the uh, jury box as quickly as possible, sending them to the jury deliberation room, whereupon the attorneys quickly uh, huddled, so to speak, and the decision was made, should we have a mistrial? Anyway, the judge told the jurors that there was great peril that a fair trial is not to be assured, and he told the court that he was firmly convinced that Mr. Childs cannot get a fair trial after the outburst. Now, this is after two jurors said they could remain fair and impartial, but one juror said that she could not. The judge obviously appreciated the uh, jury for her honesty, but following the noon lunch break, the key witness, Alonzo Velez, cousin to Childs' father, Raymond, who was called Junior by the family, testified in the hour after the killing Sunday morning that he retrieved Raymond III and drove him around Indianapolis. Now, Velez said he was present when Child displayed the gun. Prosecutors claim was the murder weapon taken from the family. Childs wanted Velez to drive him to Gary to his biological mother's house, Gary, Indiana. Anyway, instead, Child stayed at Velez's house in Plainsfield, where the teen and the man prayed for everyone involved in the killing to tell the truth. Now, Velez said that's when Childs fell back on the bed, covered his eyes, and cried. You all remember that, Velez asked Child from the witness stand. Quickly, the defense and the prosecutor's team sought to cut Velez off. As the judge was attempting to intercede from the bench, the witness then asked, Why did you do it, Raymond? That led the judge to send, obviously, the jury out. They disappeared for about 35 minutes. Upon his return, and Velez was uh, reseated in the stand, the judge admonished the witness, your behavior has caused some concerns and your behavior is inappropriate. Miller then solicited a promise from Velez to curb his comments or face a charge of contempt of court, the possibility of jail time. It was then that the three jurors, one at a time, were brought in to the courtroom and questioned by the judge. The two male jurors admitted that uh, members of the jury had discussed the comments during the break and recognized the high emotion of that particular moment, yet they thought that they could remain impartial. One juror said, nope, don't think I can. And the judge said, guess what? We're gonna declare a mistrial and we'll be back Monday to get this case back on track. You gotta be careful, ladies and gentlemen. You know. Everybody apparently knew what not to say. I'm sure the prosecution had told the witness what not to say, certain things you can't say. Uh, that's quite common so that a mistrial will not be declared and they just couldn't help it. Had to ask the question. So everybody gets to start all over again, wasting time, money, asking more jurors to come in to participate. It's unacceptable. If I was the judge, I would have held that kid in contempt if the district attorney had instructed him not to say anything like that. Next, the threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. Yes, that's right. When people face going to prison for a long time, oh, they say, why should I go to prison? He's the one that did it. Well, that's what's happening in a case down in Houston. Two suspects accused of the rape and murder of a 12-year-old girl in Texas well, they're pointing the fingers at one another as to who was responsible for the crime. Now, the Houston police last month arrested 26-year-old Franklin Jose Peña Ramos and 21-year-old Johan Jose Rangel Martinez in the death of Jocelyn Nangari. Both are charged with capital murder of a person between the ages of 10 and 15. Now, the men who crossed the U.S. border from Mexico illegally are facing the death penalty and are at the Harris County Jail on a $10 million bond. And on top of that, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, has put an immigration hold on them. So on the slight chance that these two gentlemen posted the $10 million bond, ICE would get them. They would not be able to bond out and just walk out of the jail free. Anyway, some warrants uh, requests were filed. They seek data collection from Pena and Martinez's phone. And in those warrants, they detail the police interviews with the two suspects about their interaction with the 12-year-old girl. As described in the warrant as JN, Pena told the detectives he and Martinez went to a bar around 3 p.m. on June 16th and stayed there until about 10 p.m. They began walking home, but got lost and ended up at a 7-Eleven gas station where they met the 12-year-old girl 
who had snuck out of her house according to the warrant. Anyway, Martinez asked for directions and they began walking west with the 12-year-old on uh, what is described as the street called Rankin Road. According to the warrant, Pena said as they walked, Martinez kissed the 12-year-old girl on the lips and as they approached a bayou, Martinez allegedly wrapped his forearm around the girl's neck and walked her to an area under the bridge, according to Pena. Martinez allegedly took Jocelyn's pants off and he held her down. Franklin said he told Johan to stop and that they should leave. However, Johan told him, I have to finish what I've started, according to the language in the warrant. Now, Pena alleged that Martinez then choked the 12-year-old to death, according to the search warrant, and Martinez allegedly bound her hands and feet together, and then they threw her into the water in the hopes of getting rid of any DNA evidence that may exist. Now, Pena denied touching the 12-year-old, according to the police, and they left the scene and Martinez shaved his beard and got rid of their clothes, according to Mr. Pena. Well, Franklin stated he asked Johan why he shaved his beard and Johan told him, so that they do not recognize me. Now, in Mr. Martinez's interview with police, he said that Pena was solely responsible for the crime. Eventually, he admitted to tying the victim's arms and legs and telling Pena to throw her body into the water. So I guess he's not that innocent. He's complicit in every single way. Anyway, the passerby found the 12-year-old's body in the water shortly before 7 a.m. on June 17th. Now, the uh, horrific nature of the crime has outraged the community and the police released surveillance images of the suspects and a roommate tipped off police of the suspect's identity saying that Pena had confided to him that he and Martinez made a big mistake after partying on Sunday night, referring to June 16th, and that they had hurt somebody and that that person is now dead. Well, cops raided the apartment where they were arrested, where both Mr. Pena and Martinez were residing. And guess what? One of them tried to jump off the balcony when the police came through the front door. Little did he know, they were waiting for him out by the back exit as well, the balcony. Next, this pastor is not a man of God. There's allegations that a highly respected Florida pastor could face the death penalty after his arrest for allegedly photographing himself raping a very young child. Well, the Baptist preacher by the name of Jonathan Elwing um, has a slew of child sex charges against him, including two capital felony rapes for sexual battery of a minor. Now, his arrest has, uh, needless to say, shocked the congregation and the uh, other deacons at the Vibrant Palm View Baptist Church in Palmetto, Florida, where he had been the senior pastor for the last five years. Now, the father of four was initially charged with four counts of possessing uh, child pornography after police were tipped off by a cryptocurrency company that stated that he had purchased those items um, on the dark web with the crypto. However, a uh, forensic viewing through his cell phone later also discovered a private photo vault app hiding at least 14 more images of him sexually abusing a young girl, according to the arrest affidavit. Now, Elwing now faces up to 25 charges relating to child pornography and child sex as the Manatee County Sheriff's Office detectives continue to go through his electronic devices. Ooh, that's not going to end well, is it? Probably not. Anyway, he faces a minimum sentence of life without parole if he's convicted as charged. Now, obviously, we give him the presumption of innocence. These things happen. Maybe the police got the wrong evidence from the wrong phone. These mistakes happen, right? Who, who? Maybe it was an illegal warrant. Maybe it'll all be thrown out. Maybe he will be acquitted at trial. Or maybe he'll plead guilty. We'll just have to wait and see. But in this particular case, prosecutors could also press for the death penalty under a new law passed in 2023 in Florida, which allows for the ultimate sentence for sexual battery of a child under the age of 12. And juries in Florida would have to, at least eight of them would have to agree of the uh, 12 for the execution. Now, it should probably be unanimous, otherwise I think it's going to face challenges in the United States Supreme Court. So that's what I would recommend to the state of Florida. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, detectives found eight covert style cameras in Elwing's office at the church 
who's building links with the Educational Harbor Private Christian School, where his wife was a teacher. Another two of those cameras were found at the couple's home. None of them were apparently in a compromising position. Like I said, Mr. Elwing is in custody, and um, that's as a result of the grand jury that indicted him on July 10th for the sexual battery of a child charges. So we'll have to wait and see what happens, ladies and gentlemen. We'll have to wait and see. Next on the docket, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? You've heard of that before. Uh, possession is nine-tenths of the law, right? Isn't that like legal stuff they teach you in law school? Mm, not really. So take a listen to this story, all right? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers doesn't really work that way when there's fraud, just to be clear, when there's fraud, okay? Very legal, very, very legal principle, right? Finders, keepers, losers, weeper. It's kind of like liar, liar, pants on fire defense. Anyway, there was almost a heist of a million dollar lottery ticket. So it has been reported that a customer bought a big winning ticket, but walked away empty handed. How could that have happened? Well, detectives say the clerk tried to keep the ticket for himself when the customer tried to see if it was a winner. Apparently it was a $20 scratch off ticket worth about a million bucks. The customer walked to the um, Shell gas station where he bought the two tickets and asked the clerk to check them. And according to the Rutherford County Sheriff's detectives, they say that the customer bought two $20 diamond and gold lottery tickets from the clerk, a guy by the name of uh, Patel. As uh, some lottery players do to save time, the customer just scratched off the front barcode and then asked Patel to check if there were any winners. So if you scratch off the front barcode, it'll tell you if it's a winner or not, regardless of whether you scratch off everything, according to the detective. He says both tickets were winners, but Patel only handed the man back the $40 winner, keeping the million dollar one for himself. He told him the other ticket was uh, lost, but uh, it actually was the big winner. What did he do? Patel threw it on top of the trash as the gentleman left. He took the trash out um, and seen on camera where he grabs the ticket and puts it in his pocket, according to the police. Not long after that, Patel did what anyone would decide to do, go and claim their million dollars. Well, he went to the lottery commission to claim the ticket as his own, but there were some red flags that caught the people at the lottery commission's attention. Um, for example, Patel didn't know that the lottery officials vet big winners and he didn't answer some questions correctly. And how do they vet? Well, they go back to the security video to see who actually purchased the ticket. And apparently there's some pretty clear evidence that, um, well, Mr. Patel was not the one who purchased the ticket. Therefore, it was stolen. And the prosecutor feels pretty comfortable that they'll put this evidence in front of 12 jurors and they are going to reach the same conclusion. And theft of a million dollar ticket is a class A felony. And uh, guess what? Patel is booked into the Rutherford County Jail. Um, and at least it's somewhat of a happy ending. The customer who actually did buy the ticket has been found. He chose to remain anonymous, but uh, guess what? He's going to get his million dollar jackpot. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our dumb criminals of the day. That's right, plural today. Four men allegedly um, had robbed several Los Angeles uh, stores that they thought they were getting pretty good at. What would they do? They would drive up to a 7-Eleven or a CVS pharmacy in their blue BMW. They would disguise their face with ski masks, pull out a gun to the cashier, and demand cash from the register and drugs from the pharmacy. But what did these idiots do? They posted their loot their stolen items on Instagram. And what did they say on Instagram? Love my bros. We go hit every time. One of the men allegedly captioned a post with stacks of cash per an indictment filed in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Now, who are these idiots? Jordan Leonard, Tajjar Roos, and D'Angelo Spencer. They were all arrested this week on nine counts of a federal indictment charging them with committing armed robberies at several businesses 
in Los Angeles County. They've also got some violent gun crime, leaving some uh, lasting emotional and psychological scars to the victims, according to the United States attorney, hence the reason why they're really going after these guys. And the U.S. attorney says, hey, anyone thinking of that uh, uh, violent robberies are a good way to make money should take note that there are going to be serious consequences for these actions. So the indictment charges all four men with one count of conspiracy of interference with commerce by robbery and the same charge under the Hobbs Act, which criminalizes robbery or extortion affecting interstate commerce. The four men have been uh, charged with additional counts that uh, fall under the Hobbs Act robbery uh, provision as well, that they brandished a firearm in furtherance of that crime. Yeah, that's going to be a 924C uh, and G. And guess what? Carries five years consecutive to any other crime in which they are found guilty of. Start stacking that up for seven different robberies. Ooh, you got a 35-year minimum there just on the gun charge. So it's alleged that over a seven-week period from November until Christmas Eve of 2023, these four idiots, along with other um, unnamed alleged co-conspirators, allegedly committed a slew of Los Angeles County robberies targeting 7-Elevens. And guess how much money they got? $7,617. What a bunch of idiots. Risk going to prison for the next three decades or more for $7,600? Are you kidding me? And some drugs from the pharmacy? Anyway, these uh, men would uh, target businesses in a distinct blue 2011 BMW. And uh, the indictment alleges with um, one man as a lookout, Christopher and Leonard would allegedly sometimes brandish a firearm to frighten the con uh, employee and the customers inside the business. Now, on November 4th, Mr. Spencer made a series of posts on his Instagram before and after the alleged robbery of a Los Angeles 7-Eleven with Christopher and others. One post allegedly showed wads of cash after the robbery, while another allegedly showed Spencer in black clothing with a ski mask pulled up to expose his face. In one post, one of the men published a picture of $100 bills, time stamped at 1.24 p.m. on November 4th of 2023. Loading up, he wrote, in purple font, preceded by sunglasses wearing smiley faces with a green check mark. Christopher and Spencer allegedly returned to the same 7-Eleven on November 28th. There, Christopher and Spencer jumped over the sales counter, took money and three cash registers, and placed money in a black Nike bag, all according to the indictment. Later that day, the prosecutors even alleged the indictment that Spencer dashed off multiple Instagram posts posting the stacks of cash. Well, Leonard also did the same thing, professing to love for my bros in the picture with piles of cash, tagging Christopher and Spencer. After Christopher Leonard and uh, Rouse allegedly stole about $2,000 worth of pharmaceutical items from the Los Angeles CVS on December 11th, and they advertised the stolen meds for sale on their Instagram account. I got syrup he allegedly wrote on his Instagram, which means stolen medicine in street thug slang. Now, according to the prosecutors, Christopher and Leonard were arraigned Tuesday in the U.S. District Court where they pled not guilty to the charge and they are scheduled to appear again on September 17th. Now, Rouse appeared in federal court in Kansas City, Missouri, where he was arrested and he'll be taken back to L.A., Spencer is slated for an arraignment today. Undoubtedly, he will say not guilty. All four of you are our dumb criminals of the day. The question is going to be who rolls first. Oh, I didn't do it, right? The old threat of imminent incarceration tends to break the bonds of loyalty. And how many times have we said it here, ladies and gentlemen? We've said it first. I think we should trademark this. Don't live stream the crime scene. And certainly don't brag about it before you go do it and brag showing your loot thereafter. Idiots. It just shows this generation can't do anything without putting it on Instagram, Facebook, or somewhere. They just can't help themselves. And guess what? Now these gentlemen, young men, all going to go to prison for a long time through their own dumb actions. And like we said, you can't fix stupid, but you can give it a court date. All these gentlemen got a court date. Thanks for watching today's show, ladies and gentlemen. I was supposed to be in trial, but we showed up and um, it had to be continued because of a late disclosure by the prosecution.
that was exculpatory, which means beneficial to my client that they turned over after the close of business last night before we were supposed to start trial this morning. Just saying, ladies and gentlemen, just saying. You're starting to see a pattern here. You're starting to see a pattern. All the cases we talk about, my personal experiences, I keep saying, this is, you know, DAs don't turn stuff over. It's not like it just happens in these big cases. It happens all the time. Anyway, thanks for watching. Remember, the Constitution matters.